All right. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Lord's New Church informal service. My name is Solomon Keel, and I'm so happy to be here with you this morning. We are going to start. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. The Lord said, I am the bread of life. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for all the wonderful stories in your word that teach us so many important things about our lives. Thank you for the many layers of truth we can find in those stories. Help us to take that truth and turn it into loving actions in our lives. Help us to become better and better versions of ourselves and help us to trust that you are the one that can lift us up closer and closer to heaven. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven so upon the earth give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen all right please be seated you're already seated that's great all right, so my, the title of my talk for today is The Recipe for Spiritual Growth. The Recipe for Spiritual Growth. We're going to be talking about making bread. You might see these things I have over here. Got some bread dough. And we're going to, going to be hearing about the parable of the leaven. Kids, do any of you know what leaven is? Have you ever heard that word, leaven, the parable of the leaven? Well, if you don't know what leaven is, do you know what yeast is? Have you ever heard of yeast? Yeah. Do you know what yeast does if you're putting it in bread? Makes the bread rise. That's right. So that's what we're talking about today. We've got some bread dough here, and I've got some, I actually have some yeast. This is a yeast packet. If you ever look at yeast, it's like little, it looks like little grains of something. And then when you add it to bread, it makes it rise and puff up so that when it's cooked, it's kind of nice and spongy and soft. If you don't add yeast to bread, which you can do, you get a different kind of bread, which is called flat bread because it does not rise. It's also called unleavened bread because it doesn't have leaven or yeast in it. So this is unleavened bread or flat bread. This is leavened bread. And this is the kind of bread that we're talking about today, leavened bread. The Lord told a parable about making this kind of bread. And we're going to hear that parable right now. This is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13. And again, the Lord said, to what shall I liken the kingdom of God? So he's been telling people about what the kingdom of God is, this, this idea of people in the world that are trying to be good, that are trying to do good things and be kind and loving. That's the kingdom of God. And it is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. Amen. The end. That was very short little parable and i like to think about what what were people thinking when he told this parable what what was their reaction they probably started thinking oh yeah i know what that's like this woman that would take some leaven and put it in some bread dough they, they'd probably seen this happening someone doing this this was a very common thing i was actually learning about uh leaven bread People say that this may be the oldest human-made food 
on the planet. There's lots of food that we can just eat. You can eat an apple off of a tree, but there's also food that, that humans have put together, a recipe for different kinds of food. And bread is probably the oldest of those, the, the first time that people put together different ingredients to come up with something new and that's bread. And so the people listening to this story, this would have been a very familiar thing, probably in all of their houses, they, they had someone making bread. And so they could immediately picture that that's what's happening, someone doing that kind of thing. I like to think, so how many of the people there heard him say this, the kingdom of God is like making bread. How many of the people went, oh, okay, yeah. And how many of the people just went, no idea what you're talking about. Why, why is that? Why is the kingdom of God like making bread? That doesn't make any sense. Slowly, people started to get more and more what the Lord's parables were about. But this one might have been a little confusing at first. Fortunately, we know from the word, the word of the Third Testament, what some of the symbols in this story mean. So... We know that flour, you know, I've got some flour here. It's one of the main ingredients in bread. We know what that is a symbol for. It says meal in the story, but that's just another way of saying flour. And flour, it says, is truth from which goodness develops. So it's the truths that we use to try to then be good people, to do good things, to be kind and loving. And it says that there were three measures of this flower. When I first heard this parable, I remember thinking three measures. So that's probably like three cups, right? That's about how many cups of flour you would put in a loaf of bread. But then I looked up the word, the Greek word there. It's the Greek word seta. So this is three setas of, of flour. And that works out to be about a 50 pound bag of flour. <laughs> That's how much flour we're talking about here. So this, this right here is a 10 pound bag of flour. So imagine five of these, that is about 200 cups of flour that could make probably 60 loaves of bread. So that kind of changes how you are taking in this story, right? At first I thought, oh, it's just this woman making bread, a loaf, maybe a loaf of bread. But if the people at that time understood how much flour it was, that would have been very surprising. What? Three setas of flour? How is one woman doing all of that? I don't know if you are familiar with this, but there's this wonderful, uh, children's book that I grew up with called The Giant Jam Sandwich. Any of you read this book? It's very fun. I love it. Uh, and in this story, they decide that they're trying to get rid of the bees that are in, in their town, and they decide to try to trap them with this giant jam sandwich. But what I love is the imagery of this humongous uh, loaf of bread that they're making. This, this dough fills an entire room that where they're making this bread. And then here's a picture of the, the loaf, this huge loaf of bread that is, they have to put on a cart and it, the oven that they're baking it in is a whole building. Um, I just loved this as I was growing up. I just loved thinking about how huge this was. And so this might actually be a little bit of what the people hearing this parable were thinking, what? That's a huge loaf of bread that you're making with all of that flour. So why? Why would the Lord be describing that, that much flour? The word says that truth, uh, that the number three here, three setas or three measures of flour, it represents uh, the fullness or the completeness of truth. So we could imagine that the Lord isn't just talking about a little bit of truth here. He's talking about all the truth that there is, all the truth that there is in the word, all the truth that we can learn from the world around us, from the experiences we have, from the people that are around us, so many different ways that we can learn truth. 
And part of what the kingdom of God is, is interacting with all of that truth. Not just a little bit of it, but, but trying to learn as much as we possibly can. So a lot, a lot of flour. And then we're supposed to take that truth and do something with it. You might know that in all the stories in the word, bread is a symbol for, anyone know what it is? What, what's a symbol for? Goodness, love, yep. It's a symbol for love. So it's a kind of a simple formula. We're supposed to take the Lord's truth, flour, and we're supposed to turn it into love, bread. That is the formula for the kingdom of God, the recipe for our spiritual growth. Take the Lord's truth, turn it into love, into loving actions. So that makes a lot of sense. And, and I think the people, some of the people there, the disciples might have been getting a little bit of that. They might have been hearing a bit of what the Lord was saying when he said, I'm the bread of life and getting, oh, maybe, maybe he's talking about love here. So that might have made some sense. But then we have this other ingredient that's added, the yeast or the leaven. And it says that there was leaven hidden in those three measures of flour. And here's another thing that people might have been familiar with because they came out of the Israelitish church and they were probably familiar with the concept of unleavened bread being holy bread. That was something that was true in the Israelitish church. So they may have been thinking a little bit about how there's something about yeast, something about leaven that doesn't belong in holy bread. So what is that? What could that be symbolizing? Um, there was a, a, a feast or an offering that people made in the Feast of First Fruits where they did offer leavened bread. So there's something about first fruits, something about our beginnings that might have more to do with leaven, but holy bread didn't have leaven in it. And the Lord explained more of this to his disciples later on in Luke. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And the disciples understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So, so the disciples might have started to get that, okay, yeast is a symbol for something false, something that's not true falsity and that's that's what the word says that's what the third testament says yeast is a symbol for falsity so here we have the recipe for our spiritual growth take a whole bunch of truth try to turn it into love but don't forget to add a little falsity <laughs> what 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 does that mean why why are we supposed to do that how does that make any sense well, I want to read a little bit about what yeast does, because clearly yeast is important in this recipe. It does something useful. So this is from Wikipedia. It says that yeast converts carbohydrates to carbon dioxide. That's part of the process. So if you think about what leavened bread looks like, you can probably think about how there's these little holes in it, little pockets of air. And that's because when the yeast is fermenting, when it's going through that fermentation process, it's converting those carbohydrates or sugars into a gas, into sort of an air, it's, carbo it's uh, carbon dioxide. And that makes the bread spongy, like it's a sponge. It's got those little holes or pockets in it. So it's softer, it makes it softer. In fact, the word yeast comes from a word that means foam or bubble or boil. That's what it means. So it converts it into carbon dioxide. Another thing that yeast does is it strengthens and develops gluten. So it keeps the bread sort of together. It makes it stronger. It also breaks down large molecules into smaller, more flavorful molecules. So yeast makes the bread softer uh, and it makes it stronger and it makes it more tasty. And yet it represents falsity. What does that mean? Why is that part of this recipe? It's very curious. All right, so, so what is this mystery about? What is this parable about? 
One of the ways that I like to think about this, especially when we're thinking about uh, the, the holy bread that we use in Holy Supper, the unleavened bread, that we could think about God is like unleavened bread, but the kingdom of God, we are like leavened bread. God is like leavened bread because God's love, God's truth is pure. It is perfect. There's nothing false mixed in at all. Whereas for us, we can spend a lot of our lives trying to turn truth into love, trying to turn flour into bread, but we are always going to be imperfect. We are always going to have elements of our lives that are not always true, not always good. We have uh, mixed motives. We will sometimes do things that are good, but for somewhat selfish reasons sometimes. We, uh, we have to wrestle with things. We, we need to ask questions. We sometimes have doubts. We sometimes make mistakes. And I love thinking about this first part of this story being like that, that the kneading of the bread dough, where you have to mix everything together. And this, if you've ever kneaded bread dough for a long time, this is tiring. It's tiring to do this for a long time. It's hard work to mix those things together. And that's the story of our life, that we are trying to kind of wrestle with what's right and wrong in our life, the flour and the leaven, and they get all mixed together and it's hard work. But that's part of the work that we need to do to become better people, better versions of ourselves. And it's kind of sticky and messy. You know, our lives are sticky and messy, like a, a lump of bread dough. And we, we change. We, this is describing our reformation. Literally, we're being reformed, hopefully, into the angels that we can eventually become. But that's, that's sort of a process that we need to go through where we're wrestling with things. So you could think about, Let's say somebody has done something or said something to you that has upset you, and you might have a reaction to that, and, and maybe you might say something mean to somebody else. Has anyone ever said anything mean to somebody else? <laughs> yeah, so we can see there's a lot of leaven in our lives, a lot of, of that yeast, a lot of those times when we do the wrong thing, but we, we say something mean, and then hopefully we recognize that oh, that's not really the person I want to be. I want to try to be a nicer person, so I'm going to try to change. I'm going to reform a little bit, and we wrestle a little bit more with who we are, what we want to be. That is, the word describes that process as a process called temptation or spiritual struggle, and this is a necessary part of our spiritual lives, to go through those struggles, to wrestle with what is right and wrong, to make mistakes, and then to, as Kent was talking about last week, repent of those mistakes and try to do better the next time. That's the wrestling, the kneading of the bread dough that is such a necessary part of our spiritual growth. The word has some wonderful things to say about what is happening during this time the, of the, the yeast being kneaded into that, that dough. It's a fermentation process. That's the chemical process that's happening. And this is from Divine Providence. It says, spiritual fermenting happens in many ways, both in the heavens and on earth. But people in our world do not know what these processes are or how they happen. There are things that are both evil and false that are injected into communities the way agents of fermentation are injected into flour. And these serve to separate things that do not belong together and unite things that do so that the substance becomes pure and clear. So it's useful. It's useful for us to wrestle with those things. It's useful for us to to kind of have those experiences that teach us lessons, sometimes the hard way, but it's useful. It goes on, this is from Secrets of Heaven 7906. The truth in us can never be purified of falsity without virtual leavening or so-called fermentation. That is without a fight put up by falsity against truth 
and by truth against falsity. I love that image of a fight put up. You imagine the person kneading this bread dough almost like it's a fight going on. And it's a fight inside of us sometimes. Spiritual battles or trials are fermentations in a spiritual sense because during them, falsity seeks to unite with truth, but truth spurns falsity and eventually sends it down to the bottom, which means that the dregs are removed. So during this process, as you're kneading the bread dough, you're trying to get that, that leaven to mix in with the, the flour, with the truth, but in the end, the process involves the two of them kind of separating. And that is the end result of, of what happens in the making of bread dough. So there's a lot of usefulness in us going through that kneading process. Thinking about how this has happened in my life, there are times when I might, have, might say something to somebody else. Maybe, maybe somebody has done something that has disappointed me and and I'm upset. And so I say something and I feel like all I'm doing is saying the truth. This is the truth. We just need to say the truth. And that person maybe doesn't talk to me for a while because we got into an argument. And then later in life, maybe, maybe even soon after that, the same thing happens to me in reverse where I've done something and then somebody that has upset somebody else and then they say something to me which is just the truth but it hurts my feelings the way they said it and i have that moment of going oh i did the same thing and i know how that feels now i know that that hurts to have somebody say something unkind it might be true but it might be unkind and so now where those things were kind of mixed up inside of me before, now they're starting to separate, where I can see a little bit more clearly, okay, so that's not a kind thing to just say the truth necessarily without any kindness associated with it. I need to be a little bit more careful of how I react to things. That's that separation process beginning to happen inside of me. All right, so we're kneading the dough, we're, we're doing the wrestling, and then what? Any of you kids know what the next step in making bread is after you knead the dough? Yeah? What's that? Not quite. Cooking it comes a little later. There's one more step. Do you know what it is? Do you know what it is? Letting it rise, very good, yeah. So you take this bread dough that you've kneaded for a while, and then you put it somewhere, maybe somewhere warm, you might even cover it up with something. And then the, the main part of our job at that point is to do nothing. I'm supposed to do nothing. In fact, it's even helpful to walk away from it, to not even walk anywhere close to it because it might fall. So we, we have to let it go, we have to do nothing. And I love this part of this process. This is, this is part of the, the parable that theoretically people would have gotten. Oh yeah, that's part of the process of making bread. It's not mentioned in the story, but it is part of the process of making bread. You have to let it go. I love that phrase, let go and let God. And I feel like that's part of that process. It's time to put the bread dough down. We do need to wrestle with what's right and wrong, but another really important part of the process of us becoming part of the kingdom of God is to let the Lord be in charge because the Lord is in charge and we have to kind of put things down and maybe take a break. I love the fact that what we need to do is to not do anything. It reminds me of when the Lord said that we should observe a Sabbath. What are we supposed to do on the Sabbath? Nothing. Don't do anything was what the Israelites were told. And I feel like that's part of this is the Lord saying, okay, let me take it from here. You need to take a break. You need to take a little bit of a rest in, in what you're doing. You need to have patience. You need to have trust that the Lord is changing us. Has anyone here ever watched bread dough rise? How exciting is it? 
<laughs> it's like watching paint dry. It's like waiting for a pot to boil. It's not very exciting. This bread dough actually has been rising a little bit, but if you came up here and looked at this for a while, even for if you stared at it for a minute, you would probably say, nothing's happening. There's nothing happening right here. But there is. There is a chemical process going on that we can't even see. And I love that. I love that that is the truth of our lives as well. That when we are able to let go and let God, the Lord is working behind the scenes. The Lord is lifting us up very slowly. It always takes much longer than we want it to. Whether it's bread dough or whether it's our spiritual growth, it always takes longer than we want it to. The Lord works very slowly to lift us up because that's the best way. That's the way that actually works for us. And I think that there are times when I've noticed in my life that it's useful for me to kind of put something down and come back to it later spiritually. There was a time when I was became aware of the fact that I was being too critical of the people that I loved, my family, that I, I wanted to help them, but I was, I was being critical. I was being judgmental. And I thought that it was useful to say, well, you did that wrong or, you know, that kind of thing. But in the end, it, it just came across as I didn't love them. And so it wasn't actually useful. So I became aware of that and realized I need to be less critical. And then the next day I was critical. <laughs> and I was like, ah, I was trying, trying to be less critical. But then I was, it was a habit. It was a bad habit that I was stuck in. And so I kept working on it, kept needing it. But then I also tried to, to pray about it. Lord, please help me be less critical. Please, please, please help me be less critical. And I remember having a moment where I wasn't really thinking about it very much. I was getting on with my life, doing other things. And I had an interaction with my family where I noticed that I could have been critical and I wasn't. And I was like, whoa, look at that. I wasn't critical. It's a little bit like coming back into the room and going, whoa, look how much it's risen. And I wasn't even paying attention. That's what the Lord can do for us. He can, he can slowly lift us up and then we, we are pleasantly surprised by how the Lord has, has brought our heart closer to heaven. This is true in lots of different areas of life. If you are exercising, you might know that you need to do that hard work of, of moving your muscles, lifting those weights. But if you were to do that all the time, you would actually damage your muscles. You need to actually stop and let your muscles heal. And that's part of the muscles getting stronger. You need both of those things, just like the kneading and the letting it rise. It's true with, if you've ever worked on a project, maybe in a team or by yourself, where you're working hard on the project and you're doing, putting a lot of effort into it, but then you might say, you know, I think we need to take a break. I think we're sort of beating our heads against this. Let's take a break. And you go take a break. And have you ever had that experience of coming back from the break going, ah, oh, I, now I know what to do. I can see a little bit more clearly. That's like the bread dough has been rising. The Lord has been sort of clearing our mind by having that break. The Lord taught a lot about loving our neighbor, having compassion, forgiving other people. We know that we need to say sorry when we've done something that's wrong, um, but that's a hard thing to do. That's one of those times that we wrestle. If we've, if we've said something that's upsetting, that's, that's hurt somebody else, we know we should say sorry, but there might be part of us that feels embarrassed, that doesn't want to. And that's like the, the wrestling. There's the truth, I should say sorry, but there's the leaven, I don't want to. And we mix those things together. But if we sort of let it sit for a while, have you ever had that experience of recognizing, you know, I just need to calm down. I just need to calm down a little bit. And I think I can say sorry after I've calmed down, but I can't right now. And that's like putting it down and then when we've calmed down, the Lord has then lifted our hearts, rising our hearts so that we can come back and then say, I actually am sorry. Sorry that I said that. 
And the same in reverse too, for forgiveness. If we know that we need to forgive somebody that has already said sorry to us, but we are still upset, those things wrestling, needing inside of us, sometimes we just need a break. I, th I think I can forgive that person, but I just need to calm down. And in that process, the Lord is very slowly lifting our hearts so that we can sometimes come back and actually say, I forgive you, and I really mean it. So what happens next after the rising? Some of you said it already. What's the final step in making bread? Yeah, cooking it. Yes, we need to cook it. So we can think about the, the warmth of the oven being like the Lord's love. And we can think about this idea of uh, taking this, this lump of dough that is our us, that is our life, that we've sort of tried to form into a shape now. I want to be this way, um, but I need the Lord's help to kind of solidify me into that. So we put it into the oven, and in that process, you might know, that is when the leaven is killed. That's when the leaven becomes inactive. And this is the regeneration process. There's the reformation the kneading of the dough, but the, the regeneration is when the Lord kind of bakes us with his love and we become solidified in good habits so that we, it just comes naturally to say sorry, to say I forgive you because we've been solidified that way and our bad habits have been pushed off to the side. They don't, they don't ever really go away completely. You can still taste the leaven, the yeast in yeast bread, but it's inactive. It's no longer causing us problems. And it's just a part of who we are, that we are imperfect people that have now been regenerated by the Lord. Baked into the image of the bread of life. So there we have, uh, isn't it amazing how much could be packed into that much, a little of a parable? There's so much there. And I love all of it. I love that, that idea of the flower, all of the truth that we can try to learn, that we wanna try to wrestle with what's right and wrong, like the, the kneading of the bread dough, but then also the letting go and letting God, letting the Lord lift us up, and then being baked into his image. All of that just feeds me so much in my life. And it feels to me like that recipe for our spiritual growth. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Amen.